Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your Thursday evening to be with us. I'm Teo Wolf, I'm Chief of Staff of the Spike Lab. And before we begin, I just wanna lay down a couple of ground rules uh, around Zoom webinars, just for anyone unfamiliar with the format. You'll notice that as you enter, you are muted. Uh, you're not able to talk as participants, but if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see the chat box or the Q&A box. And with both of those, you can send questions to us that you would uh, have throughout the presentation. Uh, if those are questions that we feel should be answered in front of a general audience, like there are things that are applicable to a lot of students, we will save them to the end during our Q&A section and answer them at that point. If we feel that they'd be better answered individually, then either I will send an answer on the fly if I have one, or if not, I'll forward the question on to Natasha or Lloyd, who will then be able to respond with an answer via email later on. So now I'm gonna introduce our speakers for today which are uh, Natasha, Natasha DeSherbrinen of A-List Education and Lloyd Nimitz of the Spike Lab. So if each of you wanna take it away and introduce yourselves here. Hi all, thanks for joining. My name is Natasha DeSherbrinen. I'm the Director of College Advising at A-List Education. And A-List works with families, schools, and nonprofits to provide test prep and college advising with the ultimate goal of improving college access and readiness. And my team at A-List guides students and families through the entire college application process. Hey everybody, um, I'm Lloyd Nimitz. I'm the founder and chief coach at the Spike Lab. The Spike Lab is a startup incubator for high schoolers. Um, we work one-on-one -on -one with students, um, helping them develop out their passions and into incredible projects that range from businesses to social ventures to artistic ventures in athletic academic. Um, you see a little bit of information there about me. I'm sort of a serial entrepreneur and I'm a dad. I have two little girls, two and four years old, and we're all in a small house out in the country. So if you hear some, some screaming or crying, that's, that's what's going on. Uh, great. So moving on, oh, there we go. Um, so this is actually, we wanted to spend a little bit of time getting to know you all. There are a lot of you and we don't have enough time to go one by one and you're not able to speak, you're muted. So we decided to put together some polls um, just to get a sense of, of who's out there. So you should see some polls popping up on your screen right now. Um, if you don't, uh, we apologize, but I see it. So if you could just go through, take a moment to answer the three, I think there are three questions, four questions, and, um, and then a few seconds la later, we'll take to tally it and we'll see, we'll see who's out there. I should also note, please answer these questions. Um, if, if you're a parent, answer them as though you're answering them for your kid. Ah, uh, yeah, thank you. Forgot to mention that. I think that's probably enough time, Teo. There we go. So if you look at your screen, you should see what I see that it's kind of cool to look at this. So what grade are you in? We have most People are either the parents of or are 11th graders, but a nice spectrum in high school um, and fewer 12th graders, um, which, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, regionally, most of you are in the Northeast. Um, we're all in New York normally or outside New York at the moment. I think Natasha is, you're up in Vermont? I'm right? in Vermont right now, yes. So um, that makes sense. No one outside the US. And uh, this last is your, what is your, your child's situation this summer? So the most people um, answered, some of my summer plans have been derailed and I need a new plan. <laughs> well, that's, mm -hmm. I guess that's why you're here. Um, I was kind of hoping that would be the most popular. Um, and uh, hopefully today will be useful because that's what we plan to cover uh, the most. Uh, and then lastly, these are the different categories that we'll be covering today. Um, 
and it's interesting to see which ones are most interesting. Uh, it's pretty even, but the most around career exploration. Um, so we'll definitely spend a little extra time maybe on that than we would have otherwise. Great. All right, so, so the agenda for today is, um, I'll start by sort of big picture, thinking about what are the, what are the summer goals? What, what is best practice for, for you know, planning a summer? Um, and then get into what's different, what, what's changed because of the crisis. Uh, get a little into scenario planning, which is something we suggest, as you'll see. Um, and then we'll deep dive, as I just mentioned, into those categories that you just answered, uh, different types of summer activities. Uh, spend a little time at the end on our programs. Um, we'll try to keep that real brief. And, and then open up for the last 15 minutes to Q&A. All right, great. So let's start into what best practice in summer planning. Um, there, there are four things I want to emphasize. Um, and th this is the case any summer um, when we're advising our students on summer planning. These are the things that we, we like them to think about strategically before just jumping in to like, oh, what's a cool thing to do this summer? Or, or what, you know, what my friend's doing this, I think it's kind of fun, but how to think strategically about your summer. So the first is story alignment. Is there story alignment? Is the thing that you want to do um, aligned with your personal narrative? Uh, and so a lot of students wait till the end of high school when they're running college applications to think about like, who am I? What do I care about? What really matters to me? What's my, what's the story I'm telling colleges? But it's important to have that self-awareness earlier um, and use the summer to reinforce that story, the things that you care the most about. So, so think about what your story is and make sure what you're doing aligns with that. The second is, is it challenging? Um, you know, do something that really pushes you to grow and develop and, and push out your boundaries. And you know, that's what, you know, hopefully you're doing it throughout your whole life, especially that's what, you know, high school is all about is growing. So do something that really pushes you and definitely colleges care a ton about that. Uh, that's something we all think a lot about in, in this sort of, optimizing for what? Uh, you're optimizing for your own personal growth and development and also for college um, uh, applications in some cases. The next is, is it impressive? Um, and impressive is sort of a vague word and, and we have a whole actually in the spike lab, a whole formula um, that we as nerds sort of think about. But you, you wanna think about like, it, it, when I'm done with, with whatever it is over the summer, what will I be talking about? What stories will, will I be telling? Will it develop my sense of confidence and self-worth as well as other people like college admissions looking back and being like, yeah, that was, that was a great use of time. Uh, and then lastly, um, is it revitalizing? Don't forget summer break uh, is a break. It should be energizing, revitalizing. It should you know, be a time to, to charge up those batteries because uh, the school year can be a grind, especially uh, now with the craziness of, um, well, the crisis, but just in general, I was thinking about like students have all time high anxiety levels, stress, um, and, and summer, you know, it's really important to have some time to, to unwind. So all those things are, are important to keep in mind when planning your summer. Great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's looking different this summer. And this could vary. I, you know, I think we want to say before we start this conversation is that everyone's summer is going to look a little bit different depending on where they are, right? Uh, even in the Northeast, it's going to vary state by state. But these are some of the trends that we're expecting. So the first trend we're noticing is that, you know, some in-person opportunities could be moved online. It's already started to happen with on-campus um, residents, um, you know, uh, co college courses that have um, normally taken place on a campus that are now moving virtually. Uh, we've also seen it with some internship opportunities. Usually those internships are in person and now they've created some kind of online internship opportunity. We're also expecting that uh, in the past, you know, students might be traveling internationally, whether it's for pleasure or for um, a more structured program. Um, that likely won't be able to happen this summer. So we're seeing that students are gonna be looking at more local opportunities, um, staying closer to home. The last trend that we're seeing is there's this movement from learning to service. And 
you know, in some ways you can learn through service. I think they go hand in hand. Um, but I think a, this summer in particular, it's really important for students to be thinking outside of themselves and how they can help in some way contribute to what's happening around them with a crisis. Okay, so uh, we talked a little bit about scenario planning earlier and, and it's definitely really important this summer to think through um, what your life is going to be like. I know we are, you know, a lot of us are speculating right now and we don't know. Um, and so the best way to kind of move forward is creating two plans that you're equally excited about. Um, so you're going to create a plan for that best case scenario and that worst case scenario. Um, and right now that plan A might be um, a plan that you can act with minimal social distancing. Um, and that plan B could be something that could be um, enacted with continued social distancing. We're seeing that the best plans, our suggestion is that the best plans are really flexible opportunities that could work in both scenarios. Um, you know, if you have to pivot, uh, you know, we're seeing everything changing day by day. Um, month by month, it's going to look really different. So maybe in June, things are still closed and in July, things start to open up. Um, so more so than this year, we, we really have to be flexible and nimble with the opportunities that we're looking at so that we can pivot if we if things start to open up and you have opportunities or, you know, things close down again, um, you, you have kind of two different plans that you're working with. Um, and again, I think it's important that you're really excited about both those plans. And today we're hoping that you'll find uh, you'll you'll think about some ideas that can really excite you. The other thing we'll say is that um, you should have, uh, you know, flexible opportunities that work for both. But if you have a structured opportunity, um, so this could be maybe work that is really tied to being in around large groups of people, or it could be um, maybe a, a summer camp or a program, something that's very structured that might not be able to move online. Um, you really do need to have a plan B in case, uh, in case we can't be all together again this summer. Uh, the one piece of advice I'll give for parents, if there's parents, and I think there are a lot of parents on this um, webinar tonight, that uh, as you help your, your child really think through what to do this summer, um, you know your child best and you know what support they might need in creating structure around this summer. This summer could look really unstructured for students, um, depending on if we're all at home, uh, you know, creating some structure so that uh, they have different opportunities um, that they can explore and knowing what opportunities are going to be the best for your student. So thinking about uh, really structured opportunities for ninth and 10th graders if your student needs that support and maybe some more um, less structured self-led opportunities for students who are in their junior or senior year, if they can handle that kind of uh, responsibility and independence. Um, you ultimately wanna make sure that your, you know, your child's not sitting around and is bored, uh, but you also don't want them to return to school completely exhausted and burnt out. Uh, to Lloyd's point, this is supposed, summer's supposed to be fun, right? They are, you know, you are teenagers or, you can remember when you were a teenager that summer is supposed to be that kind of break and release from school and all that stress you experienced during the, uh, the school year. And I think this year, more important than ever before, we'll want that kind of break and sigh of relief. So whatever plans you do make for the summer, make sure you keep in the back of your mind that the ultimate goal is to return to school in the fall really re-energized and ready to go for the school year. So, um really quickly, this is just the intro to, we'll go through these eight different sort of summer types in order and do a deep dive into each one, starting with a combination of guided versus self-led learning. Great, so first I just wanna define guided versus self-led. It might seem a little uh, obvious, but you know, those guided opportunities are the opportunities that are a little bit more structured, um, where students are given something that they just need to follow along. Whereas self-led learning is something that um, requires a little bit more independence, where students are managing the process themselves and exploring themselves and don't have necessarily someone, you know, leading them along the way. Um, so again, returning to that idea of knowing your, your child and what opportunities might work best for them if they will, will require and be more successful in a guided setting, a guided opportunity versus a self-led opportunity. Um, but we've tried both for you today. So um, these are the categories and this is just, a, you know, a sampling. This does not cover everything, but some of the ideas that we came up with. Um, and I think if you were to pull a couple from each category, you could have potentially like the most awesome summer ever. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for the summer to be, even though it's different, um, very much the same in some ways. We just gotta think creatively about how we take advantage of these opportunities. 
So, you know, academic programs um, for students who might have had an academic program that was supposed to be on our campus, thinking about if you want to take that online option, most of those have moved online. So thinking about either taking an online program or um, if you would like something that's a little bit more self, uh, self-led self and you don't need that guidance through a course that's very structured, you could take a look at some of these other opportunities like Coursera or edX and take a self-paced course all on your own on a topic that's really exciting to you. I think what's really great about these programs is it allows students to explore academic interests and try out college majors. Um, and for some students, it really gives them an opportunity to confirm their interest in a subject or actually reject it. I've had a lot of students who have tried uh, summer courses and then realized, oh, I actually didn't know that was what engineering was and I hate it. Um, and so now I'm not gonna waste my time in applying to engineering schools my freshman year. I'm gonna focus on something completely different. Um, so it gives you your student the opportunity to try that out before really fully committing. Uh, one thing to note there is that there are um, credit opportunities for credit opportunities and non-credit opportunities. Um, so that you could look at college classes that your, your child or you could actually get that credit uh, and bring it to college with you if that college accepts that credit. So if that's important to you, make sure you're looking at that distinction because a lot of programs will offer them and then a lot of them are non for credit and are more just for exploratory purposes. I think both can be really beneficial. Um, you know, Khan Academy or language courses, Duolingo. I've had a lot of students who have decided they want to take up a new language during this time at home. I commend them for that. Um, and then life skills. I'm sure parents will like this one. Um, but, you know, learning how to do laundry before you go to college, um, changing the oil in a car. I don't think I knew that you had to change oil into car in a car until after I graduated from college. Um, and that's why my car after college probably died very quickly. Uh, creating a budget. Um, a lot of students haven't, you know, learned how to, you know, manage their money. And so learning how to create a budget, gardening, if that's an option for you, wherever you are. Um, makers projects. Uh, this doesn't have to be uh, something where you need to have a 3D printer in order to make something. Um, there's plenty of things you can make at home. I've seen some really creative things from students um, building furniture, decorating, you know, a dresser or even their bedroom door with permission from the parents, of course. Um, but you can get really creative during this time. And that leads to creative arts. So thinking about, do you want to learn a new instrument? Um, there's plenty of free resources on YouTube. You can go on there and teach yourself how to play guitar if that's something you always wanted to do. Um, photography, teaching yourself. Uh, you know, if you do have a camera and you want to go outside and safely and explore and, and teach yourself photography, journaling can be really helpful, especially during this time of crisis. Um, athletics, I think it's so important right now that we're all getting outside and moving our bodies as much as possible. I know it's what's keeping me sane at the moment. Um, so, you know, trying a new uh, sport or practicing yoga, um, training for a race. I was thinking that'd be a really good time since I have time now to train for a marathon, but I don't think I'll get there. <laughs> Maybe a 5K, uh, we'll start there. Um, weight training, if you are, just on a side note, you know, if you normally are playing a sport during the spring season or, uh, or during the summer and those things have been canceled, it's super important that you continue to train and stay in shape um, and then think creatively about how you can do that at home. Um, I've been using like soup cans, you know, to, to lift weights at my home. So uh, there's all, uh, plenty of ways you can, you can keep your body moving. Um, and then, you know, getting outside, so, so important during this time, whether that means actually being outside in the mountains and hiking and camping or just going for a walk down the street. Um, we put spelunking on there. I think that was Lloyd's idea. That's, you know, I think there's some caves outside New York and you can check that out. Um, picking up a new hobby. Um, so our point is, this is again, just scratching the surface, but there's so much you can do this summer if you think creatively. And all these things, by the way, count for college. Um, one is not more valuable than the other. The most important thing is that you're hitting those goals that you know, Lloyd outlined at the beginning of the, of the presentation. Um, so this is just a sample. And I hope that some of these spark some, some uh, fun ideas for you guys. And we'd love to stay in touch and hear what other ideas you guys could add to this. Maybe you can type some ideas in the, in the chat box um, during the presentation. And with that, I'll pass it on to Lloyd. Awesome, there's so much, it's really exciting. One, one of the things I also recommend is creating your own, if you're doing self-led learning, creating your own learning plan, you know, so your own curriculum. Um, so you go into it with a schedule and sort of uh, that's something we do with our students that, that I find helps if, if it isn't guided. Um, all right, so 
but most people said career exploration was their top interest for the summer. So I'm going to maybe spend a little more time than I had allocated on this. So, so these are the three general categories within this, gener this, this bigger category, career exploration. Um, so let me go one by one. So career research, uh, and I really love this, by the way. I think it's a great way to spend the summer or part of the summer. Um, and so career research, um, what we mean by this is um, if you have a career direction or various potential careers that you're interested in, or even if you don't, it's, it's researching them. It's, it's understanding what, all, what are these careers like? What are the different jobs? You know, it's sort of, if I go back to my high school days and the students I work with, you know, they usually don't have a great understanding for what, what, what these fields are like and, and what types of roles there are, are out there. You know, for example, I think doctors have the 23 different types of doctors you can be. Well, okay, you want to be a doctor? Well, you know, you can't be all 23. So really deep diving, even if you really know you want to be something, there's so much deeper, you can, there's so much deeper you can go. Um, engineers, there are 40 different types of engineers. Scientists, there are 50 types of scientists. Um, and so, you know, and, and, you know, general categories, and you can go even deeper. So, so really dive in research. You can research by you know, going online. In today's world, you can get so much online, as you know. Um, but also, don't forget to reach out to people, especially now in the crisis. We found with our students that people are more available uh, if you're, you know, comfortable as a young person reaching out, um, you know, people will talk to you, um, especially if it's, you know, a warm lead through, through parents or through friends, parents, um, you know, you can, you can really find and talk to people. So don't just stick to your comfort zone and going online to research, but also talk to people, which actually leads to the second category of a career study trip. Um, I went to business school at Stanford and, you know, most business schools nowadays have this thing called a study trip where you go off with your classmates and you spend like a spring break in like Beijing and you, you meet all the, you know, people in your like tech in Beijing category or finance in New York. Um, and we recommend doing a similar sort of thing with our students. Our students have done this in the past, which uh, this is sort of the plan A if you are able to travel. Um, but we actually recommend for this summer Again, keep it local because you don't really know what's going to happen. So, in your region, um, if you are in, you know, a, hopefully a city where there there are jobs and interesting careers that interest you, um, set up your own study trip and and you know go out and, and talk to people and set up meetings. And it's a really flexible. We talked about flexibility being really important, so that you can easily switch from plan A to plan B, or you don't have to really have a plan B. Um, Career study trip is very flexible in that if you know if you can't go out and meet someone in person because of social distancing, social distancing restrictions, you can just do a Zoom call like this or or a phone call, um, and it shows a lot of initiative and it's more personalized. There are structured career study trips out there, which if you Google it and search a little bit, um, you'll find some of them, um, which can be great, especially if you're a younger uh, a younger student, ninth grade or below or, or you're just not comfortable, you know, reaching out on your own or you don't have anyone to help you with that. But if you're older, I really encourage you to create your own, one, because it's more flexible, but two, it's more personalized, more aligned with your interests. And you're not beholden to someone else's sort of planning. Um, and then last is internship. Um, and everyone kind of knows what internship is. Um, but a couple tips around internships. So again, uh, keep it local. Uh, that way you have more flexibility. Again, because you know, it'd be much better, more valuable to do internship in the office uh, and with sort of being in the real world. But if you can't, it's very easy for that to shift into remote work, um, which you know, most of you know, we're all sort of in that situation. Most of us are in that situation. So, so you know, still go for that internship, but if it's local, um, you one you you can keep it flexible because traveling is going to be much harder um, if it's not in your your region. And, and then it, you know if you really can't go in um, for any of the summer, 
uh, then, then you can do it remotely. Um, so that's this concept of convertibility. So just think about convert is, is your summer plan convertible? Some things are very structured. They're just not, some are, are more convertible. So that's something to, to think about as you're planning. Um, and just general tips for internships. Um, a lot of students just jump at the first sort of cool opportunities that come out, um, or that parents have a connection, but they end up not being aligned with their story, which we talked about earlier. And then they end up not having a very cohesive story and it's not reinforcing who they are and what they care about. And so the more you start with the things you care about, what your story, and then you look to reinforce that through an internship, the more powerful and usually the more engaging it is for students. Um, colleges are wary of internships sometimes because a lot of the best internships are given through personal connections. So it can be a sign of privilege. Um, and that's another reason to keep it authentic and keep it tied to your story. Um, otherwise, a lot of colleges will, will discount it as just ah, a nice checkbox um, that, you know, Johnny got because of his dad or mom. So, so keep that in mind. Um, and another thing is be proactive. A lot of people wait for like internship programs um, or like existing internship roles on like internship job boards, which exist out there. We recommend Idealist as a good one. If you're looking for like actual openings that organizations and, and companies are putting out there. But also remember that um, a lot of companies like us, the Swike Lab, for example, like we take interns, but they have to be proactive and we never put out a role, but, but we're willing to take interns and we've had an intern every summer. So, so you, know, you just reach out and that's another sort of um, push to think about what you really want and then find the companies and organizations that fit that and then reach out and you, you know, pitch yourself. All right, I went a little longer because you all asked me to. Um, community service, local and remote volunteerism. Um, you know, it's the same idea of, you know, there, there is, uh, oh, and one of the trends we talked about it, you know, things are moving more towards service this summer because there's so much need and, you know, we're in a global crisis. So, so people are just naturally moving in this direction. You don't have to, but, um, but it is, you know, it is something we, we encourage, even it to work, to work service into what you're doing in some way um, or doing a little bit on the side. Um, and then you know, the same idea of um, convertibility, flexibility, there is a lot of remote volunteerism. You see some organizations on the right side, their logos that have lots of lists of, of things you can do if you just want to be inspired with ideas or actually find opportunities. But again, go back to your story, the things that, that speak to you. Think about the populations that you care about that are really personal for you um, and, and serve those populations. You know, so, you know, elderly are in need or the homeless are, are in, you know, severe need right now uh, due to the crisis. But, you know, there's also just people in your school community or, you know, you know, your family. So, so think about what speaks to you and then look for opportunities that, that align with that. Um, so a couple other tips here, personally meaningful, like I said before, like something, the populations and causes that you care about, really think about that first before, before jumping in. Um, and then socially impactful. You really want to have impact. It sounds kind of obvious, but I can't tell you how many people, especially during the school year when a lot of schools have these community service requirements, they're doing things because they have to, or they feel they should. Um, and they think just, if I volunteer at a nonprofit, it's definitely going to be like impactful. But sometimes it's just not. So think about the work you're doing before you just jump in and, and look for things that you're really excited about. And then at the end, you can be like, I did. I did X, Y, Z, and this is the impact I had. And that can even go into your college applications. Uh, but more importantly, like you really want to have an impact if you're going to dedicate your time. Um, so moving on to the next category, independent projects. And this is the one that I get the most excited about because this is what the Spike Lab is all about. Um, a spike uh, is our word for a really cool independent project, basically. Um, and, and I'll get a little more into that. So this is what we do day in and day out with our students. And we have 
students doing incredible things and the summer is a great time to do independent projects and it's very, very flexible because you run the show and you can do what you want. So it's a great thing to think about this summer if, if this speaks to you, but it doesn't speak to everyone. So it's not that you should do it. It's just a great option um, if this speaks to you or your, your, your kid. So these are the types of things that, that people are doing, but the nature of it, it's very bespoke. You know, it, it's, it's personalized to what you wanna do. Campaigning for a cause, starting a club around a topic or, or um, sort of hobby that you're really into. Um, you know, coding an app, a lot of tech oriented people are building things. In event, you know, we have students, you know, filing for patents and, and developing like really cool stuff. Uh, a lot of artistic stuff. And these are a few examples, you know, students who write books or plays or, um, you know, poetry compilations or, you know, filming movies. Um, it, you know, students are amazing and they're capable of doing incredible things. Um, so um, a few things about how to go about an independent project, things that we think are best practices and things we do with our students. And I'm gonna kind of whiz through this for the sake of time, but, um, don't just do the project, think about purpose. Think about your purpose. So do that self-discovery work first um, and make sure it's aligned with your story and what you care about. Um, here are some criteria that I'm not gonna go through, um, but um, you know, think about the criteria we talked about in the beginning, you know, best practices over the summer, as well as these other criteria, meaning, make it meaningful, impactful, um, persistent, it's not just the, one and done sort of thing, but it's it's something that shows that you have depth of, that you're really committed to it. Initiative, that you're a leader, uh, you know how to make things happen in the world, and uh, impressive, we talked about earlier. <clears throat> and just a few tips, keep it super simple. Um, when you're launching a spike or any sort of independent project, um, you don't have that much time, and you really wanna do something. You don't just wanna sort of come up with an idea. Um, so starting small, uh, as small as possible initially is, is really important. And then snowballing it out, so building it out over time. Um, and a lot of independent projects will spill into the school year if you're starting them over the summer. And we really encourage that because it shows that persistence and commitment that, um, you know, that college is looking for, but also that makes it more impactful and exciting for, for students. Um, and just keep in mind the enablers. Uh, independent projects require time, so make sure you have enough time. You can't just squeeze it into one hour, you know, every other day. Um, and most important is ownership. These are you as a student. This is, or the, you know, this is your project that you're leading it, you're driving it. But make sure you have some support because these tend to be pretty ambitious, depending on what you do and um, you know how what your age is, but you know, have some support. I mean, that's what we do as, as coaches, but it could be parents, it could be an uncle, it could be a mentor, advisor, um, having a bunch of friends or peer support. It's really important in order to get something real off the ground. Um, so this uh, young woman in the middle here on the upper left corner, that's Julia. She's one of our students. And I'm just gonna give you a little example um, to break things up. So she developed a, a project that, um, I, I guess I would summarize it as a artistic project focusing on photography. So she developed out a very special type of multimedia photography series, which she ended up, which you see here, uh, she, she ended up displaying them in pop-up galleries where she literally um, rented Airbnb rooms in different cities and showcased her, her art series, her photography. Um, but her series was based on something very personal to her, um, which was around the experience of uh, children growing up in single parent households. So she grew up with a single mom and you know, that affected her in, in a lot of different ways. And so before doing the actual photography, she went out and interviewed dozens of, of young people a similar sort of single parent household and learned a lot about their different experiences. And it was a lot of just sort of discovery for her um, about people and about herself. And then she ended up 
reenacting these people she met and sort of dressing herself up and doing these sort of self portraits. And, and then the galleries weren't just to show her art, but they were also to discuss um, her, to, to have these discussion groups around the, to the topic to bring awareness to this issue. And so, you know, th this was a really powerful project that she put together uh, on her own. And, and these are sort of things that, that, you know, you can do or your, your children can do, um, but it takes some planning and, and some thought. And it really checks these boxes on the right, meaningful, impactful, persistent initiative. She ended up continuing it on and uh, it had a really big impact and it was part of her college application. Okay, so, so just sort of next steps, like how to go about this, a reminder, do the self-discovery work up front, um, identify a project, don't just pick the first thing, but really brainstorm, try to pick more than a hundred ideas. Like, like brainstorm lots of ideas, explore them more, come up with more ideas, and then converge down on the really the best one. Um, that's a lot of the work we do in a nutshell in the beginning stages. And it, if you do good work up front, the projects end up, end up being really energizing, revitalizing, and, uh, and, and kind of awesome. Okay, uh, so moving on to just really fast independent research. Independent research we have is a different category. Um, I kind of think of it as similar to independent project, except the project is research. And I just want to remind you that there are structured programs. There's a really good one called Pioneer Academics and there are other ones out there um, that sort of pair you up with a professor and put you in a specific area of interest like neuroscience or, or whatever, uh, you know, like biology, or you can do the same sort of thing, but as a self-led uh, process. Both are great. Um, we've had success in our students doing both. And uh, it might be a little late in the game for these, for the good structured programs, if you haven't already applied, um, but it's totally fine to go self-led. Just our tips are, um, you know, summer is not independent research to really be good research. Um, you, you don't, it's very hard to do in a summer as a young person. So you want to have an advisor uh, to help guide you to write, ask, have the right theses and create the right experiments, have access to other people, um, and also try to use data that's available. Don't try to go out and create your own data sets up front if that's required. Okay. Great. Um, so in the summer, another good use of time is preparing for your college applications. I know that we have a lot of juniors on the line or a lot of parents of juniors. Um, so the summer is a great time going into senior year to get ahead of the college application process. Um, if you save it all to the fall, it will be stressful. And so there's ways you can do little things this summer to get ahead. Um, our advice for students is to continue to prep for the exams as usual. Um, there have been a number of schools that have gone test optional since the crisis has started but a number of schools are still requiring the tests. Um, and even the schools that have gone test optional, you can still uh, set yourself apart with a really high test score. And so our advice is to continue to prep for the exams as usual um, with a D emphasis on the subject tests. You really should be focusing on the SAT and the ACT tests. Um, ALIS is doing a webinar on test optionality and what that means uh, on May 14th. So more to come on that. Uh, but there's too much information to cover. Uh, so that's gonna be a whole nother webinar, a whole different day. Um, the second piece of advice is to stay uh, the path and build upon your relationships. I know it can be really hard with students um, when they're home right now and they're learning through Zoom or other means through the computer um, to stay on top of their schoolwork, to continue to build upon their relationships with their teachers um, and their mentors. But this is a really important time, especially junior spring, to continue to work really hard in your classes, even those that are pass fail, um, to the best of your ability, knowing that there are some constraints and challenges during this time. Um, and, and thinking about, you know, if you're not seeing your teacher every day, but you know you want to ask for a recommendation from that teacher, make sure you're still in contact with them regularly and, um, you know, continue to connect with them and, and have that relationship. 
The third piece of advice would be to research colleges and create a preliminary college list. It's uh, a little bit challenging right now to be on college campuses. So there's a number of resources uh, you can explore to, to virtually research colleges. And in fact, we're gonna do a whole nother webinar on that as well, another whole topic uh, that deserves its own webinar. Um, we're doing that in collaboration with Campus Real on May 21st, some more info to come on that. But this is a really good time to start thinking about what you want from your college. Um, you know, on the last webinar, I said that students are really recognizing what they miss during this time. Uh, it's never been so apparent in their entire lives of, of what's important to them because they're realizing they're not getting it right now. And the things that they're taking, you know, normally everyday stuff that they take for granted, they realize, oh, I actually really need that as part of my life. So having students really think thoughtfully about what's important to them can be a really nice jumping off spot for uh, building that college list. And then the last thing is to start working on your college essays. This is something that students can certainly do this summer, but they can also start right now. Um, A-List does do college essay boot camps, so we'll be doing one every month uh, throughout the summer, June, July, and August, um, if students need support with that. Uh, but you know, the, the main personal statement is a good place to start. And then thinking through supplemental essays, the Common App doesn't open until August 1st, but students can certainly start to develop uh, their supplemental essays for those common topics, like why do you wanna go to our school and um, tell me about an extracurricular experience or uh, a, a community cervix experience. And um, thinking about that with you know, what they're doing this summer, some of that you might wanna wait on if they know they're gonna have that experience or thing they wanna talk about uh, this summer. Um, you know, some, some really great essays can come out of these summer experiences, especially some of this independent project work. Uh, so you know, thinking through when is the best time for, for you individually to start that essay, but um, there's no reason you can't at least start to brainstorm and think through some, some strong topics for that. Uh, main college essay now. The other, or uh, the last thing we, I think we want to know is that um, there's there's a lot to consider, right? We, we certainly aren't covering it in its entirety on the webinar this evening, but um, two other considerations would be work. So what does that look like for students that might have jobs um, that really rely on us all being together, whether that's, you know, a lifeguard at a beach, uh, whether or not that will open up or working at a, a restaurant. And so making sure that you have that backup plan um, and thinking through other possibilities uh, that can happen with or without social distancing. Um, and then caring for family and loved ones. Uh, maybe this summer, you know, things are gonna look different for your family and you will need to spend more time babysitting a younger sibling or spending more time with a grandparent taking care of them and, and helping others. Um, and I, we wanna make sure that students recognize that all that is valid for the college application process. Um, they can certainly include all of that on their activities list. Um, especially, you know, I think it's super important to show uh, schools how, you know, you are, <laughs> thinking about others and thinking about your family during this time. And so there's certainly some credit for, for doing that hard work, whether it's earning money um, for you and your family or for caring for loved ones. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, a lot of families we work with don't realize how much colleges put weight on, you know, just caring for being a caretaker and having that summer job and, and a lot of amazing things happen. Um, in that kind of stuff. So uh, just to summarize, uh, it's really our summary slide. Um, create two plans, uh, unless you have really flexible sort of convertible activities, um, then you might not need a plan B. But if you don't, if you have structured things, which some of them are great, but then you'll need a plan B. And just worth putting in that extra time to, to do that scenario planning. Um, so you're not sort of stuck in case, um, you know, in case things don't, don't get better. Um, and then, and then lastly, just a reminder of these, these four best practices, sort of the important goals for, for the summer is, and to keep those in mind as you're in this, this summer planning stage. Okay, great. Just a little bit uh, about our organizations and, and then we'll, we'll get into the, the Q and A. Um, we're a few minutes behind, but we'll, we'll go fast through this. So, so as I mentioned, we're like a startup incubator for teens. We have students from like seventh grade actually uh up until I until they graduate and um uh and but you know we're, we're tied to college admissions but our bread and butter are these independent projects these spikes that help them learn uh like what's really my purpose what's meaningful to me and then how do i pursue that in a way that 
shows innovation, entrepreneurship, and, and initiative, where I can really build something that has impact in the world. So, so really about building those skills uh, so you have kids have that for life. Um, we're one-on-one -on -one coaching, so it's all about the coach. We spend so much time recruiting these incredible people who have real entrepreneurship experience, but have also you know, gone to top selected colleges and understand um, both sides of that. Um, and they're you know, great educators in the sense that they are in an educator role. So, so these are sort of, we call them unicorns. I have a whole blog post about how, uh, how amazing these people are. And here are some examples. Um, I kind of took you through the logic of our six stage process. The first three uh, stages are self-discovery, identification, validation. Um, so, you know, understanding your story and then figuring out what your spike is. Um, it's a three month starter package uh, where it's weekly one on one 90 minute sessions and that costs $6,000. It's, it's really sort of white glove. Um, we get to know students really well. And then um, our families continue on a monthly basis based on whatever uh, is best for them. Um, so if you're interested in this for over the summer um, or, or any time, uh, we have a lot of students starting up now or right after exams uh, to help them build out that independent project over the summer. Um, feel free to uh, go to our website or this link at the bottom of the screen and you can set up a free consultation with us. All right. So for A-list, our business is really, you know, tutoring and college admissions. So for tutoring, um, we're going to be running three live online group classes this summer for students planning to take the SAT this fall. Each class will be comprised of 18 hours of instruction and three full-length uh, practice tests. And then two of our schedules are open for students at all learning levels. One schedule will be reserved specifically for students beginning with a diagnostic score of 1250 and above. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we do have that test optional webinar on May 14th. Um, so keep an eye out for that if you're if you're wondering what test optional will really mean for you or for your student this this uh, coming fall. And then with college advising, um, so we know this is this is my work. I love this work. Um, we do everything from building the college list to guiding students through the college essay. Um, we are doing boot camps on both the college essay process and on a separate one on everything else, including you know supplemental essays, building the college list, um, getting into the real uh, nuts and bolts of every part of the application process. So um, keep an eye out for those coming this summer. There'll be one happening every single month this summer. Um, and if you're interested in learning more or you just want to talk about all things college admissions, um, I love to do that. So feel free to schedule a time to meet with me. There's a link down there and um, we'll make sure that you get that with the recording so that you can sign up for, for a session to speak with me about college admissions. Okay, so now some time for questions. Uh, so feel free to send additional questions in via chat or via the Q&A feature at the bottom. But we got a few here that we're gonna start with. Um, first question for Natasha. Uh, and this one's a toughie, I think. Uh, <laughs> given that this year, a lot of people are going to be taking a gap year or deferring, uh, what does that mean for admissions for current juniors when they're applying to college? And how does that affect what they do to prep their applications this summer? Oh, that's a good one. I have so many thoughts on this. Um, so the way I've been thinking about this, um, so, you know, colleges are, we're already seeing a lot of students that are deciding to defer and take a gap year um, for the schools. You know, there's just a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen this fall. So, you know, if they are not able to fill those spots, if there's a lot of students that are deferring and they're letting those students defer um, and they can't fill those spots with people off the wait list and they're going to have a smaller class than years past, um, they we're likely going to still have to fill those seats the following year. Right. So they're, they're going to have to make up for those lost seats um, coming in the following year. I still think it could make the following year a little bit more competitive because now you have these students coming in who deferred already filling seats. Um, that paired with, you know, I think when, when schools go test optional, they often become more selective. There's more students are, that are applying to those schools. They become more popular in a way. Um, so a lot of considerations in terms of what to do this summer. Um, I think anything that... Um, you know, everything that we talked about today, really, it, it's finding what you love. It is committing to exploring and um, 
staying authentic so that, you, you know, what uh, Lloyd was speaking about with telling your story and making sure your story is coming through to the missions counselors. Um, it is writing a stellar standout essay. I cannot emphasize the importance of an essay in this process. It can really uh, be the make or break for students who have the test scores, who have the grades. Um, the test, the, the essay and activities are really what set you apart. So it's that essay and it's that activity. Um, I think students need to really be thinking outside the box this summer. It's a really uh, great opportunity for, to show colleges um, your creativity and, and what you're interested in, what you really care about. So I'm looking at this summer with uh, rose colored glasses as an opportunity. Uh, you know, students are, are kind of being forced into this position, but I actually think in the end, they'll benefit from having this kind of very different summer that will allow them to show them, show the colleges what they're made of. Just, just building on that creativity piece, I, I just think it's a really important point to, to hammer home is that you know, colleges are going to be, what, what's happening right now is that like all these plans are thrown out, there's all this ambiguity, and some students are just deer in headlights, deer in headlights and not really able to react because they're, they're, they're not sort of driven or have this sort of independence to think for themselves. Uh, it sounds harsh, I know, but this is the way college admission officers are going to be looking. And then there are all these other students who are, you know, creating campaigns and getting involved and saving people's lives and, and you know, doing other, you know, things um, and able to adjust and, and, and respond. And, you know, you want to, you want to be one of those students, um, uh, not just for college admissions, but, you know, these are, these are great skills to have in life. Great, so next question is for Lloyd. This is two parts. First part is, what type of projects do students tend to work on with the Spike Lab? And how long does it take to create a Spike? Good question. So there's no like type. Um, it, it's really, it starts with the purpose, the passion, the individual story. Um, you know, so, you know, I'm, I'm working right now with, because uh, I, I take on two to three students myself. Um, and you know, one of my students is really into sports analytics, and uh, you know, sort of like, like data analytics and sports. And he ended up he's building out like an uh, education content creation organization where he's building out sports related um, like articles and videos that educators can use to teach statistics and math, um, but like really cool and relevant and tied to sports. Um, and so, you know, that's like totally different from another student like Julia you met earlier, um, or my, my other student is uh, developing out a culinary art, uh, I'm sorry, culinary history um, project where he's going around the world, uh, not, not himself, but he has like built a team of people who are based around the world and they're collectively researching, you know, like, different ingredients and telling the history of a certain location based on the ingredients. And he's, you know, developing that out and building a website and he's really into it because he loves that stuff and he cooks and, you know, ties into his whole story. We have students who've written and published books. So it's, it's all over the place. And, uh, you know, there isn't a type. Um, it's, it's just like whatever comes out and it has to be very creative. It's really fun to work on these things. As you can tell, I get kind of excited. Um, well, Taylor, what was the se second How question? How long does it take to launch a spec? How long does it take? So I had that really brief slide. Uh, our students almost, depending on their age and maturity level, they'll pace through our program at different rates. It's just, we can't structure this as a cookie cutter thing because everyone's different, different ages, different maturity levels. Some start with a project that's underway and they want to level it up and scale it. But generally in the first three months, um, they will have that story figured out. They'll have a pathway to purpose, we call it, like a sense of what is really meaningful and important to them. And they'll have identified a spike idea and have an implementation plan in place um, in the first three months. Um, and then it usually takes another two to three months to launch that project and really start getting some sort of traction in the real world. And that's really important. Like our, our program is really all about traction, like real impact, really doing stuff. Cause that's where kids come alive. That's where they, they build self-confidence and self-worth. 
Um, it's like really doing something um, around something they care about. So, you know, this whole kiss, keep it super simple, like that enables it to be faster and to build the confidence and, and build the skills. Um, you know, so if you're doing it on your own, really keep in mind that if it's too ambitious in an initial project, that initial thing you're trying to launch, um, it, it can take a year and then you lose momentum and life gets in the way. Um, so, so make sure you start small. So the, the short answer is usually between three and six months, it'll get off the ground, but you know, our students will continue this, you know, through high school, usually, but you don't have to. Okay, so next question is for Natasha, and it is, should students still put their canceled summer plans on their application? Great question. Um, yes, I think that the additional information section in the Common App will be the perfect place to put that, um, depending on, and, and that goes for the spring, by the way, too. If you had something that was happening this spring, you should put that in the additional information section. I don't think it should be a lengthy paragraph explanation about why it didn't happen, but just simply list whatever you had planned that was canceled. Um, and then, you know, make sure that you're filling it with something uh, equally as exciting and fulfilling. Great, okay. Uh... That was a shorter answer than I expected for that one. <laughs> um, next question here. Uh, so for summer programs that have moved online, or this is for Natasha as well. Um, for summer programs that have moved online, is it still worth doing them? And it, or is it better for students to design their own summer program instead? Oh yeah, I think that's so, uh, it's a very good question. I think it's really based on the individual student. So um, really look at that curriculum, what they're offering you. I think it's, uh, important to recognize that while everyone is doing the best they can, uh, if they've moved everything online, they likely have scrambled to put it together in the past couple of weeks online. Um, so look at what they're offering you, make sure it's still very much aligned with what you want to do this summer, um, and make sure that you're still going to get the same value out of it um, if you're at home on a computer um, versus, you know, if it was in person. Um, and what was the second part of that? I think there was a second part. <laughs> Um, let me put one up. Oh, and it was it better to like design your own summer program as right. opposed to doing one of these online ones? So I think if you evaluate and you see that actually, you know, I'm not going to be getting as much out of it online based on, you know, what they're proposing, uh, then I would recommend if, if you feel like, I mean, know yourself and know if you're able to do a self-led program. Um, and yeah, then if you, if you feel like you're independent enough and you have the motivation and self-drive to be able to do an independent program, whether that be a program or an independent project, then yeah, go for it. You'll probably be able to customize it a little bit more to what you want and make your summer anyway. And, and just to build on that, I totally agree. Um, some of these programs, just like schools, have dialed down the amount of online like Zoom time. And, you know, you can, so if, if you're doing a, a, you know, you, you got into some great, you know, free college program or whatever it may be, and you still want to do that, have that experience. If it is less commitment, a few hours a day, four or five hours a day, you still have other time to do an independent project and do other things. Uh, and my suggestion is just to try to have them overlap as much as possible. So if you're doing research or you're studying some, you're in some class, um, you're taking an online class, that's, that's rigorous, like a college level, sort of college credit class. Uh, you can do a project that connects to it so that the projects in the class, if there are, and there probably will be projects because there, a lot of these programs are moving to project-based learning. So you have stuff to do outside of the, the screen sort of content delivery classroom style online. Um, do those projects that align with these other independent things that you might be doing over the summer. So, so the more overlap, the better. Okay, so we're slightly over time, but I'm going to take one last question here. Um, and this one, I'm going to direct at both of you, because I think we'll both have something to say about it, which is, how can we as parents support our students during this uncertain time? I, I can jump in. Um, yeah, so many directions to go. Um, and I, I think one is... Man, I mean, anxiety level, you know, you have to comment on the stress and anxiety kids feel. So that's like the first thing is, you know, they're going to role model you. Uh, you probably already know this by now, but, you know, just make sure that to the extent that you can, like, be a role model of, like, calmness and 
um, so that they are, are less stressed and, um, and, and don't, you know, don't, don't make them feel like they're, you know, that they're like losing their summer or, you know, anything like that. Um, I think that's like just a kind of common sense thing, but I actually see a lot of parents who, you know, are freaking out and, or, or just sort of stressed about it all. And, um, you know, it's, it's tough for kids if that's the case. And then I just reiterate the, the creativity side of things is you know, use this as an opportunity to encourage them to do what they want this summer. Like that's, uh, they have sort of a blank in, in a lot of cases because things are being canceled or, or, you know, families don't really want to do that online version of whatever they were going to do. There's sort of a blank slate and it's sort of like, well, yeah, do what do what you want. Do something serious that you care about, but go for it. And we trust that you're gonna you're gonna make the most. And we find that kids just take full advantage of that, and they do really cool things. Um, so, yeah, that's another sort of tip. Yeah, and I would just piggyback on the um, you know what you were saying, Lloyd, about anxiety. Um, you know, we're all feeling it, and I think our teens are feeling it twofold. Um, you know, perspective is built on experience and they don't have as much experience in this world as we do. None of us have experienced this, um, but certainly, you know, our, our teens are really struggling with really understanding what this means and having whatever year canceled, whether it's junior spring, especially senior spring, any of these years for them, uh, you only have four years of high school. And so it could be, if they might be feeling like their world is, you know, falling apart right now. Um, and for a lot of students, that's totally valid. And so I think validating that May helping them manage that anxiety by encouraging them again, I think like getting outside and moving our bodies like that is the best way to release anxiety in these moments, um, making sure that they have time to do that. Uh, I think it's a really fine balance between structuring the summer, depending on what it's going to look like, you know, making sure there's structure and that they're doing something um, fulfilling with their time uh, with also just like letting them explore and have fun this summer. And it might look very different this summer than years past. It might not. Um, but making sure you're recognizing what your individual child needs in this moment, whether that is a really jam packed structured summer or like a very fluid summer of I'm trying this out and now I'm trying that out. Um, you know, I think both experiences, as long as they're, they're fun and fulfilling and meaningful for your child, um, are equally valid. Um, and, and in this instant, we don't know what, the, what the future holds. So, um, embracing the uncertainty as much as possible, um, helping your child, uh, kind of ride this wave and, and seeing it as an opportunity to do something, uh, that has never been done before, um, this is, I think, a really interesting moment, especially from the college admissions side. College admissions counselors are also sitting at home right now, not knowing what's going on. Um, and this is going to be a really interesting year for them when they're evaluating applications. So recognizing that they're in the same boat and thinking about, um, you know, how can we take advantage of this really cool time in history and do something really awesome with this time? Uh, so that's what I have for that. Yeah. Yeah. Just the last, I can't resist, but like, <laughs> such a good point. Like, Tell your kids they're living history like this is mm -hmm. history in the making every textbook is going to be have this and you know tell them to write their own history you know be a part of that history uh that's that's like what i like to tell people i guess i'm excited a lot of them yeah, so thank you everyone for joining us today uh, if you have more questions please feel free to follow up with with either natasha or lord uh, you can also book free initial consultations with either of, the, either of us so if you have admissions or standardized test questions um, we have that link from the earlier page if you want to go back lord for for natasha's um, they're right there so if you have questions about that um, you have that consultation and then if you want to talk about building a spike or um, like how to launch a great independent project this summer, you can book a consultation with us with this link right here. Um, and we're also we'll also be sending out a follow-up email that will have these links as well. But I hope you have great evenings. Um, Lord and Natasha, any closing words you want to say? No, thank you all for yeah. spending time with us. I hope it was helpful. Thanks so much, all. Stay safe. Take care. Yeah, I hope you all have a great evening. <laughs>